Uh, you know what? It's such, um, I know it brings me such joy. We, we, we've been love uh, communicating with you online through live, our live stream and that, but it's just something about um, having people in the room and worshiping uh, God together. And so thank you so much for being here. And uh, for those that are watching online that, that couldn't register for this week, try again next week. And, and we'll be moving to an ex- a, a second service very shortly. And so be patient with us. And so uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being in the room. Um, whether you're watching online or here in the room, we welcome you. You, as Crystal said so many times, uh, you belong here. I'm not going to say it with this kind of dance that she does it, but uh, in my heart, I, you, you belong here. And so last week, we began a series called No Strings Attached. And the heart behind this series is a, is a journey through Scripture showing us the love of Jesus shown through the intera- his interaction with people. And what is evident in each uh, interaction is he turns uh, uh, cultural and religious expectations on its head. Most often he does that. And maybe today you're in this room or maybe today you're watching and your experience with, with religion hasn't been a good one. Or maybe you have had a terrible experience that has left you avoiding anything to do with God. And we are going to find out through this series that God's love for you is so profound. Everybody say profound. So profound that it changes our life. It really does. And maybe you're, you, you've, you're, you've experienced some version of his love, but not the real deal. And last week we met Jesus at a tree with Zacchaeus, and it was a great message by Pastor Megan. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. And today we're going to find out that Jesus, his love can be experienced from the most unexpected places. And today we are going to join Jesus at a well. It's, it's true of this story and of our story today that Jesus knew this person by name before he ever met her. And if you are here this morning and you're wondering if God knows you, if you're watching today and you're wondering, is, 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 is God too far? He knows you by name. And here's true of, of most, if not all the people Jesus interacted with. When it, Jesus is intentional about meeting someone, a few things happen. One is this. Jesus goes out of his way. What, look, read scripture. Uh, he goes out of his way. There's a pivotal moment and there's a life altering change. It, it goes something like this there's a, a divine meeting, a pivotal moment, a life altering message, a miraculous change, and a new momentum. And Jesus shows up in such a way, even today, and, and if you are open to it, his love for us can alter our narrative and set us on a new path. Amen? He can do that, and he has done it. He is with his disciples, and they go off into town. And Jesus, it says, is tired and sitting by the well at noon when the sun was the highest and the hottest. And what we cannot, we cannot be lost in is this, the fact that Jesus was setting up a divine meeting. If you remember the first time you came to Christ. Jesus showed up in your life. It was a divine meeting. And he's, he's creating this divine meeting with a woman from Samaria, despite some religious and cultural background. And it says this in verse 4, now he had to pass through Samaria. <laughs> and I want us to, to, to land here for a moment because Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. As a matter of fact, there was a route that went around Samaria. The Jews believed that the Samaritans were complete sellouts and they despised them. As a matter of fact, at the time, the Jews would pray in the synagogue that God wouldn't even answer their prayers. Now, how is that? He wouldn't answer their prayers. That's how much they despised them. It's in this context that Jesus doesn't have to go through Samaria, but he's compelled to go because there is a, a what? A divine meeting waiting for him as he sits at this well. Now, let's not lose the moment here, okay? That's what Jesus does. His no-strings-attached kind of love breaks through both religious and cultural barriers, tensions to meet with someone. His love for others doesn't come with a religious and cultural uh, strings attached to it. There aren't, uh, aren't conditions based on your background or your, your religious bend or your culture. He moves away from religious drama to have a divine meeting with someone. And last week, we, he met Zacchaeus despite his reputation in, in, in the community as, as, as a, 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 a cheating tax collector. As a matter of fact, he has a meal with him, or at least he goes to his house. And here he is meeting a Samaritan woman at noon at a well. That's what 
our Savior does this morning. And if for some reason you think that you are disqualified from this kind of life-changing love, John chapter 4 is here to remind you today that Jesus at any point in your life will go out of his way to meet with you. Amen? And scripture tells us it's at noon. You didn't get water at high noon. It was hot. We can't understand that in this Newfoundland weather the last couple of weeks, right? You know, but at high noon, it was hot. It is the hottest time of the day unless you don't want to be seen. And unless you didn't want to witness once again people huddling and whispering about you and, and fall silent when you show up. This is what she experienced. And in John 4, Jesus, who could quench the thirst of our weary and soul, is thirsty. He's thirsty. Not only that, but this woman thickens the plot right from the beginning. It says in verse 8, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? It's an interesting question coming from the, the Savior of the world. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And the, see, the disciples are gone into town to buy food, and a Jewish rabbi talking to an outcast asking for a drink from a Samaritan bucket, which a Samaritan hand touched, this was unheard of. Place yourself in those shoes for a moment. She comes to the well at noon to avoid people, and as she approaches the well, she sees a Jewish man sitting there, and immediately both religious and cultural strongholds threaten her. She knows her boundaries. But Jesus makes the first loving gesture to her by admitting that he needs her help. <laughs> it's an interesting moment. She isn't used to, th to this because if you know her story, men took things from her. Now she has a Jewish man asking for help. How disarming is that? Will you give me a drink? How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, she says in verse 9. And Jesus right here violates one of the basic man-made laws, and he speaks to her. A rabbi would never speak to a woman in that day. And what is profoundly significant here in John 4 is not only does he admit he needs help, but he meets one of her basic needs, and that was the need to be, to be heard. To be heard. She needed someone to talk to her instead of about her. She, she needed a man to look at her differently than so many others did. She, she needed someone not to reject her because of her past, her religion, or her reputation. Here is what you need to catch here. This story moves from a divine meeting to a pivotal moment. And in this moment, how disarming and inclusive Jesus is. He doesn't turn her away. He meets her right in her messy middle in her story. And see, and the motivation for Jesus in this pivotal moment with this Samaritan woman wasn't to trap her. It wasn't. It wasn't a got you moment. You see, and this is profound and we need to remember this. God's motivation for sending his son Jesus wasn't to trap us, but guess what? To what? Set us free. Amen. If you have an empty bucket, he wants to meet you where you are. Your pain in the mess of where you are, that's who he wants to meet. Not a cleaned up version of you because he specializes in messes. How can you ask me for a drink, she says. And Jesus responds, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. Let's not forget the moment. She has a reputation She's a, little, she's a little jaded and cynical. She has been lied to, lied about, talked about. So it's, it's, it isn't a stretch to assume she is bitter. Maybe she's thinking, living water, that's a new line. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than the father Jacob who gave us this well and, and, will, and, and, and drank from it himself as did his, also his sons and his livestock? When talking about Jesus, anytime when you start your sentence with you have nothing, you are always wrong. 
<laughs> it's true. The disciples tried that later on in John when they were feeding the 5,000. They said, you don't have enough food to feed these people. Jesus takes what is there and he feeds the multitude and people went home with food. But the woman doesn't know this yet because all she could see was the externals. Jesus, you don't even have a, 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 a bucket. <laughs> It's so profound here in this moment. Jesus has, cre- has this, created this pivotal moment. You, 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 you always show up before noon, he's saying to her, when it, it is least hot or uh, uh, the hottest. But you would never show up in high noon. But she wants to avoid the accusations and stares. But she goes out at noon and meets her maker and she doesn't even know yet. Isn't that like God though sometimes? You're in the in room today or you're watching today and you have avoided church or God today and he, he, has a, he, has, he has arranged this pivotal moment for you at your well. So she goes to the well with her, with her bucket, not looking for a, a God encounter, not looking to have her life changed. And here in this, it's the stranger sitting down by the well with his legs crossed maybe, talking about how he has better water to give her. She's looking at this stranger and is asking, how are you gonna give me water without a bucket? Verse 13 says, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And indeed, the water I give them will become in them spring, a spring of living water welling up into eternal life. Jesus is saying, you see, you're focused on what is around you, and I want to focus on what's, what's in you. What's in you. She had been fed a lie, you see, church, that love comes with all kinds of strings attached to it. It's the kind of love where you have to give to get. And one of the greatest threats to experiencing the love of God is someone else's version of it. It's true. We have a, 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 sometimes a religious culture filled with versions of God's love that is conditioned on religious barriers that, only, that, not, that not only a, 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 um, if you don't have those th- things in front of you and in your life, you don't fit the bill. As if one religious group has the monopoly on God's love. And that's what's at play in this story. She had a version of religion fed to her by religious pe- people. Her version evokes feelings of hurt, mistrust, and Jesus breaks past these barriers. And he's concerned about her experiencing this love on the inside. But up to this point, it's all been external for her. It has to be one of the, the reasons I think he dismisses the disciples before he meets with her. I would venture to guess because the last thing she needed to hear from someone else was a version of how you come to Jesus. Let me ask you a question today. In this room, watching today, what version of God's love are you communicating in the places that you occupy? What version of God's love have you been introduced to in your journey? Does it feel like condemnation? Does it feel like I have to measure up? I have to carry a certain religious badge or pedigree in order to be accepted. We have to to deconstruct our man-made version of how a person receives God's love. The price has been paid. Jesus paid the ultimate price. And all the guilt and all the shame was laid on him so that when we come to him, it is freely given. Now listen to this truth. It says, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You have to recognize what is at play here in this context. Jesus is using the the well as a prop. He, he didn't come to the well to take a drink, to break. He came on purpose because she had been fed a version of love that includes too high of a price. And he is deconstructing it. She thinks this pivotal moment is all about a bucket. Jesus is depicting to this lady on this hot summer's day when your body is saying physical water, Jesus is, say, is saying it's not about the bucket How many buckets will you go through before you realize the reason you are not satisfied is because you are standing at the wrong well? He has given her a kind of like a product comparison. 
the well or the, the living well. And your life isn't, sad, isn't changed because you have been fed a version of love. And now Jesus moves from this divine meeting, a pivotal moment, and into a life-altering message. Watch her response. The woman said to her, him, Sir, give me this water so that I, may, I won't go get thirsty and have to keep coming here to, this, this, to draw water. Now her response may not have been a pure motive. Because she wants this water. So she, she doesn't have to keep coming out in the day to be met with looks and condemnation. She is still thinking about versions of the real thing. And he goes to spin on, she goes to spin on her heels and he says something else. So go call your husband and come back. Hmm. My kids would go, in a, in a movie with this pivotal moment, they would go, dun, dun, dun. Right? Now, I've heard versions preach of this text. And more often than not, I've heard this preached. Jesus, who knows everything, pulled a got you moment on her. He pull, pulled a, a divine attribute, fully God, knowing everything. But, he's, but, but what he's really doing here is he is graciously guiding her and truthfully telling her. That's what grace does. That's his love. If anyone understands grace, it is Jesus. He sees this woman who needs help, and his motivation for, her, for her, this life-altering moment isn't to catch her in a sin, but to free her to live in the kind of love that will change her life. And see, church, our motivation to live out God's love in this world isn't a project. It's not a gospel project. It's because we have been freely loved. You hear what I'm saying? That's why we love people with no strings attached, with no religious expectations. Serve people with love, with no motivation other than to display the kind of love that you've received. Be generous to others with, with no strings attached. See, the gateway to people's life is our love for God lived out. Amen? It's the message of the gospel. How God so loved the world that he gave, and he gave to you while you were in your sin. We get this idea that we have been all cleaned up before Jesus comes or God sends his son. No, in, in your worst moment, when you weren't even thinking about God, Jesus came. That is profound, church. Not when we were all cleaned up. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to ask you to engage in an opportunity called Be Kind for St. John's. We were going to ask you to be kind by giving food for our food drive. But when you bring food... We're going to give you a be, some be kind resources. In it will be opportunities for you to live out God's kindness in the places that you occupy. But pastor, you know what? What is the catch here? There's, there's no strings attached. Just take the, the contents and be kind to someone. Live out the transformational love of Jesus and be kind. And that's what Jesus is doing here in John 4. He's deconstructing her idea of what it is to be loved by God. Live in this moment, church, for a moment. She came to the well to avoid the very thing Jesus is confronting. He goes to the place she wanted to hide to talk about the thing she wanted to forget, but he never uses the knowledge of her past as a weapon of judgment. It's love. It's love. And maybe every time you try to raise your, your, your life above your mess, you have someone reminding you of your mess. And trust me, she already knows what she has done wrong. She knows it, and those around her reminded her. If, see, if our motivation is to be known for whatever we're against, we will never have the kind of conversations with people that Jesus is having here. And this is what I love about the culture here at Bethesda. We get that. We get that. We're, we generously love. We generously give. We create a space for people to have relationship and be introduced to Jesus, and I love it. And he already knows about her poor decisions. Just want to let you know. He came to that well knowing. It's what's so amazing about this moment. He knew and his love for her motivates Jesus to go out of his way to hear her story. And while this woman is wander, wandering, wondering how Jesus is going to get, get into the deep places of Jacob's well without a rope or a bucket, he was reaching deep inside of her soul. I believe he saw her desperate thirst to be loved with the kind of love that doesn't run dry. The kind of love that is unfailing, only he could offer that. 
And if you have had that kind of story this morning that tempts you to run from God, this story is tailor-made for you. That is why broken people were drawn to Jesus. He, he, he loved those around him unconditionally. That includes the truth to, to help her out of her pain. I mean, aren't you glad, church, that he doesn't give up on us? He didn't let this woman sneak to this well alone and leave. And he'll do this for us. He will stay with us. He, he has been pursuing you maybe this morning in the middle of your broken story and he sits down by this well and he says, you have been dipping down in all the wrong wells, in all the wrong places and you're still empty. Six husbands and you're still not satisfied, he's saying to her. And then she hides behind religion. She says, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And he speaks about things that she wants to avoid, so she pulls the religion card to deflect. Classic move. And I love the rawness of this moment. Jesus then sweeps away her intended distractions by saying, actually, it's neither. It's neither this mountain nor Jerusalem. God wants the kind of worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. Speaking of which, let's get back to you. And I have a feeling you could use some spirit and truth. And, so, and in so many words, Jesus is saying, here's what I think. You could use real love, but you can't move past your past. So listen to me, you dear, precious priceless child of God, the God, the lover of your soul is longing to connect with you, not on a mountain, not in Jerusalem, but right here, right here now. And she fights back tears and no doubt says the next line with a sense of kind of like, could it be? And she says, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. It's almost as if she's saying, could this be you? This is such a profound moment because the answer to her broken life was standing right in front of her. And it cannot be missed in this moment, in the moments of our life. It's all, it, and what I love about this life-altering moment is he didn't confront her without giving her a solution. It's so profound. Jesus is reminding us that the truth of your sin is never separate from the truth that, that can save you. So he acknowledges her sin, but the answer is right there. Wow. He was lovingly confronting her, and, he, and in that confronting, he was giving her a way out. Not only has a Jew spoken to a Samaritan, not only has a rabbi spoken to a woman, not only was he deconstructing her idea of what it is to be loved, but for the one, loving, but the, the one lovingly looking into her eyes, into her shame-filled soul, was God in the flesh, the promised Messiah, the long-awaited Savior. And I'm talking the, about the creator of the universe, the light of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the source of living water, the source that can wash over her soul and make her new. What a moment. What a moment. Then Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, I am. And he, a divine moment, a pivotal, a divine meeting, a pivotal moment, a life-altering message, and now a miraculous change. The, 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 the disciples show up and found him talking to a woman, but no one dared to ask why he was breaking the rules. And what's even more profound, she didn't care about their stares and, and visual disgust because something happened. She had been changed. It says in 20, verse 28, then the key, this is the key verse. I love this. Then taking her water jar and leaving it. It says it. Leaving her water jar. Who she met at the well became much more important than what she came to get from the well. She left her jar and it says, the woman went back to town to the people who she was avoiding, by the way, and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. <laughs> everything that he, he knew about her. Could this be the Messiah? Now notice, she still has questions. 
She hasn't had time to correct her behavior, but she has enough faith to take this first step. She isn't sure, but we do know that she left the thirst of her body because Jesus was quenching the thirst in her soul. And because of this miraculous change, she now has a, a new momentum, a new story. And a strange thing happens when Jesus de deconstructs her idea of love into a new experience that changes her life. God uses the most unlikely person for the greatest impact. It says, they came out of the town, as I conclude this morning as the band returns, they came out of town and made their way toward him. They followed her to meet the one she had met. She came to a well, she met a well, and she became a well. That's why she didn't need her bucket. Now she is carrying the living water. It's because she met true love that she had the greatest impact. And that is why everything we do filtered through the love of God will always have the greatest impact. Can I say this today as I end? Doing things in the name of religion without love is always the wrong motivation. Jesus chose a relationship with her over religion. And when God's love flows to you, then it can flow through you. Amen? She wasn't ashamed to tell everybody about this no-strings-attached love. I met a man that didn't want something from me, but he gave something to me and changed my life. See, a divine meeting, a pivotal moment, a life-altering message, a miraculous change, and a new momentum. Because Jesus stepped into the messy a part of her life with a alter, life-altering message of love, not someone's version of it. And her life was never the same, never the same. Now we know why he went to that well. Would you stand all of this room? Now we know why he went out of his way, broke culture and religious barriers, sent his disciples off, sat down by Jacob's well. He was digging a well in her heart. And, and, and he changed the most controversial person in town and through her deconstruction and reconstruction of what real love is, the town came to see. And Jesus is saying today, as we conclude, I know everything about you, yet I love you. And I want, I want to meet you where you are in the messy part of your life and exemplify, maybe for the first time, what true love is. And it goes like this, a God. Romans 8, 3 says, what the law was powerless to do. What the law was powerless to do was done through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And maybe this morning, some of you are watching or here in this room, and maybe you've been digging from the wrong wells. Maybe, for the, maybe you've been finding your strength in things that are not sustainable. Maybe you're at the pinnacle of, your, of business or, or, or the secular world and you're still empty. Maybe you're at the depths of despair and you're still empty. Maybe you are digging from the wrong well and Jesus is showing up in the middle of your life. Maybe at high noon when it's the hottest and he's saying, let me give you real water. Let me give you the kind of water that will quench your thirsty soul maybe for the first time. Would you bow your heads all over this room and maybe today for the first time in your life you want to make that step of faith in your life. Your heart has been thirsty. You've been seeking other things. And the truth of this word today in John 4, he, God doesn't confront our sin without a solution. He stood there with her, he confronted her, but he also had the solution to, to quench her thirsty soul. And today, that solution for you is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you wanna repeat this prayer, very simple. Maybe you're watching today. You wanna repeat, the, repeat this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, repeat it. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Will you be the Lord of my life? I want to serve you. 
I want to love you for the rest of my time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate for anybody that said that prayer today in this room. Amen. The greatest decision of your life is not a business decision. The greatest decision of your life is not a, a secular decision, a social decision. It is that decision to make that step of faith and serve Jesus Christ. Amen? We believe it today, and I'm a testimony of it. When I sing songs that we have sang here today, the pastor don't get excited. It's the person who met Jesus for the first time, who, who, who was headed down the wrong path, and God saved me. And that's true for you today. And we want to celebrate for you with you. If you made a decision this morning in this room, please make sure you connect. There's a card in the seat ahead of you. If you're watching online, uh, one of our hosts is there to connect with you if you made that decision today. So let me end with this. Let's move outward now before we sing. Who is the recipient of the love that changed your life? As you occupy spaces in your world, in your context this week, who is the recipient? Who is witnessing the love that you have get, been given so freely? Not some version of it, but the same kind of love that shows up at wells, that goes out of its way like Jesus did to meet with people and just love people. Just love people. Who's that in your life today?